So this is our first ethics and governance speaker uh, series event of this school year. For those that don't know me, I, uh, my name is Kyle Hubbard and I teach in the philosophy department here at St. Anselm and serve as the program director for the Center for Ethics in Business and Governance. The Ethics and Governance Speaker Series is a program of the Center for Ethics in Business and Governance, a center whose mission is to enrich the knowledge and practice of principled ethical behavior on the part of individuals and corporations and society by engaging important questions and issues in business ethics. So in light of our mission, we are particularly excited for Professor Finn's talk tonight on justice in the workplace. For those who may not know, funding for the Ethics and Governance Initiative is provided by the New Hampshire Secretary of State's office with the express intention of promoting ethical thinking and corporate citizenship in the state. New Hampshire was awarded that money in a settlement between the state and Tyco International. For uh, the younger folks in the audience, uh, the Tyco scandal with uh, Dennis Kozlowski at the Helm broke in 2002, around the same time in the same months as the Enron scandal, which you may have heard of. It was actually one of the largest corporate scandals, uh, really, of all time. Um, the Tyco scandal serves as a startling example of unjust actions by a firm. So it's our hope that with tonight's program and many others like it, we can shine a light on how firms can employ more just practices. So to introduce our speaker and uh, the topic for tonight, I will now turn the microphone over to Jason Carroll, who is a senior business major from Wethersfield, Connecticut, and he's an intern this fall with the Center for Ethics and Business and Governance. So welcome, Jason. Daniel K. Finn is a professor of theology and Clemens Professor of Economics at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, a Sister Benedictine institution. He has a distinguished career in theological ethics. He is the former president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, the Society of Christian Ethics, and the Association for Social Economics. Dr. Finn is the director of the True Wealth of Nations Research Project at the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies located at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. He has authored or edited nine books, published 54 articles, and has lectured widely in Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Dr. Finn has also led a successful affordable housing campaign among five cities in central Minnesota. Dr. Finn, we are grateful for your presence with us today and eagerly await your lecture, Justice Within the Workplace, The Power of Structures, Not Persons. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Finn to the Hilltop. Good evening. Good evening. A little late start, but that's okay. Huh? Um, I want to talk about justice in the workplace, but most of what I'm going to talk about tonight is not about justice, but rather ways of thinking about the workplace that will help us think about justice. But not just the workplace, all kinds of what we call social structures. And I think we have a lot to learn from our colleagues in another discipline, sociology, who have studied social structures. And it helps to understand what a social structure is if we want to understand the workplace, or the classroom, or your parish, or the Tuesday evening bowling league. Uh, these are all social structures. And there's something about social structures that it's important to know before we can act, I think, act well about issues of justice. So I want to begin with a couple of facts. So fact number one, uh, powerful people often feel that they don't actually have much power. I remember experiencing this as a young academic many years ago. I was on a panel with a CEO of one of the Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 company, I guess, in Minneapolis. And I was just flabbergasted that he told this crowd that he really didn't have much power. And I don't think he was lying. He just felt like so much of his decision making is constrained by what he needs to do. 
given what the conditions are and what the firm needs, he didn't feel like he had very much discretion on most issues. So I think it's true that many powerful people don't. In fact, most of us who have power don't usually want to admit it. How many professors talk about the power they have over students? How many parents talk about the power that we have over our children, right? So, fact number two, most of the power of powerful people in an organization arises not from that person, but from the position that the person holds. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? Somebody's president, somebody's a, your professor. That's why they have the power. But we need to put this together. And so let me ask you to think about your own life and to think of two examples at a job you had. Or if you can't think of a job, think of a classroom example or a parish example or whatever other example of something that you didn't really want to do, but now you're so used to doing it, you don't even complain about it anymore. So think about something at your work where you had to do something, you didn't want to do it, but you had to do it, and now you don't even think about it. And then think about another one, but one that still bothers you. <laughs> that you're doing it, but you're aware you don't want to be doing this. Big or small, it hasn't got to be a moral issue. It might just be how the copier is being used or whatever. Huh? Think of something about that. And we'll come back to this later. So we need to think about the social world. And sociologists tell us that there are two main parts of the social world. And for some reason, um, there's a word or two not coming through on this screen. Anyway, culture is intelligibilia, putting it very generally. It's meaningful things, ideas, beliefs, symbols, but games and statues and stop signs, anything that has a meaning in our, that we run into in life. And the other half of the social world, sociologists tell us, are social structures. So I'm going to ignore culture tonight, which is a terrible thing to do, but you don't want to be here all night, right? So we're going to just talk about structures and think about them from the point of view of what sociologists have to say. Now, the first problem we have is that sociologists themselves don't all agree. And so we have to choose which brand of sociology, and I'm going to just impose a brand on you today, but I'm, I'll try to explain why. So um, among the options in sociology, there are two that I'm going to reject tonight and hope that you might as well. Uh, one is collectivism, social determinism, structural determinism. It's the view that social forces are so powerful that we're pushed around on, at, in life like pawns on a chessboard. We really don't have much choice. Now, there's not really any human freedom if the social forces are that high, that strong. And that's a reason why I think from the point of view of ethics, especially Christian ethics, we can't go there. But the other is a more individualistic point of view that says all there is in the social world are individual persons and groups that are making decisions and making things happen. But everything in the social world is reducible to a decision of a person or a organization, a, a group. Huh? Um, this doesn't give enough credit to social structures, because as I'm going to argue, they have power in our lives. And I'll try to persuade you of that as we go along. So what I'd like to propose is something called critical realist sociology, uh, because I think it is a more adequate way to think about our social life. Critical realists talk about culture too, but I'm not going to try to do that tonight. So what does this amount to? Well, only persons are moral agents. Structures are going to have power, but structures are not agents. They don't make things happen. And yet, they have causal impact in our lives. And that's kind of a mystery at first, but we've got to think about that. The impact they have is not deterministic. It doesn't make us make decisions in a certain way. But they kind of push us to make decisions in a certain way. It's through their influence on our choices that structures have an impact on us and make certain things more likely, certain decisions less likely. And I'll give you some examples, but let me first talk about what a social structure is because it's not immediately obvious. Here's a, a definition from sociologist Douglas Porpora. A social structure is a system of human relationships among social positions. 
So it's the social positions that are in relation to each other, and we enter into those relationships. And the social structure is the system of all the relationships. So take an academic example. Huh? The relation between position A and position B is, they say, ontologically real. Think of the relation between professor and student, and we'll come back to this. But there is a relationship between a professor, no matter who it is, and a student, no matter who it is, in a college. And that's the essence of this insight. So let's think about St. A's. Huh? Imagine a newly hired professor enters the classroom, comes on campus for the first time, enters the classroom, and takes on a position of a professor in the classroom in relation to the students who are there. Takes on a position. Uh, position of a junior colleague among senior colleagues in the, fa in the faculty department, uh, has a relationship with the dean and the president and lots of other relationships here too. Huh? So if we just focus on the, the most essential one in a college, the professor-student relationship, we find a good example of what structures do. Social structures generate restrictions and opportunities. And these restrictions and opportunities change the decisions of the people in the position. So think of that young professor. What's the restriction the professors face? Well, they're not supposed to drone on in long lectures, right? They're supposed to be prepared, answer questions, structure discussions, give grades. Now, you don't have to do this in the sense that you have no choice, but any young professor who doesn't give grades is not gonna last very long, right? Uh, and probably just somebody who drones on is not gonna get, it, get tenure here. You have to be a good teacher. Huh? But think of the student as well. Students have restrictions when they enter the position of students. They have to take exams, do assignments, attend class. Questions are asked, but should be asked respectfully, which you might not do in the pub, right? But in the classroom, you're going to be very respectful to the professor. These are restrictions. But again, you don't have to do that. You could stand up and just get angry at the professor, and, and maybe you have, but not many people do, because there are penalties you, f you face if you do that. First of all, everybody in the room is going to look at it like you're, like you're crazy. Uh, the professor's not going to like it, and you're going to worry about your grade. These are restrictions that we face, but also opportunities. The professor gets to devise creative explanations for difficult ideas. One of the things that we love about teaching is be able to explain things in a way that people say, oh, I get it. Uh, engender student learning interest, learn a living, of course, uh, get tenure and have security and lots of other things that professors get to do. And students have opportunities because they're in that position of student. They can learn from an expert, prepare for later life. So the view of social structures is that they have an impact on us. Uh, and if I'm the student in the room, I think of the professor as the one doing all this, but it wouldn't matter who the professor is. It's the relation between the professor and student. And certainly from the professor's point of view, I worry that are these students going to think I'm giving an interesting lecture, but it doesn't matter who the students are. That's part of the relation between students and professors. So social structures have an impact on us because of these restrictions and opportunities. We take up opportunities that look good. We don't do certain things that we're going to be penalized for. So where did it come from? Well, social structures emerge from the interaction of persons. So I have to apologize here. I can't just say I'm going to do social science before we get back to justice. I've now got to do natural science before I can get back to social science. We have to ask, what is emergence? So if we think of it in the natural sciences, water emerges from hydrogen and oxygen. So the idea of emergence as a special category is that the thing that emerges is different from the things that combined to produce it. So hydrogen and oxygen both will feed a fire, right? And water will put out a fire. Water has characteristics that hydrogen and oxygen just don't have. Something new has happened here. And so emergence occurs in this way. Huh? Lower level elements combine to generate a higher level reality that has new characteristics different from those of the lower level elements. So this happens in the natural sciences. Uh, Protons in the atom, we're told by physicists, they emerge from up quarks and down quarks that are even smaller. 3.7 billion years ago, the first living organism 
emerged from a slurry of chemicals, none of which were living. Something new happened, right? Human consciousness emerges from the physical brain. In each case, something new has occurred that does not just share the characteristics of the things that combine to make it. So emergence is a fundamental part of how the world, the natural world, operates. And so um, we say the world is stratified. Now, this talk about different levels isn't really levels in a literal, physical, geographical sense. But there are different levels. Uh, and the, so the world is stratified. And our disciplines more or less talk about this, that physics talks about one level of existence. But chemists, who are now talking about things that are more complicated, physics is plenty complicated, but chemistry has more complications, they have new methods. Think of biology. Living organisms have to be studied in a different way than chemi chemicals do. Think of psychology. Psychologists certainly have to know how the brain operates, but there's a different level here. And so the idea that the world is stratified is not just an idea in ethics. It's not just an idea in social science. It's an idea in the physical sciences. But it does apply to our friend, the social structure. Because social structures emerge from the interactions of persons. And they exist at a higher level than those persons do. And just as some emergent realities can act back upon the elements that created them, water can't act on hydrogen, but the, the human consciousness can act on brains, as we know brain surgeons do. So social structures can act back on human beings in the way we just described. They generate restrictions and opportunities that alter our choices. So, where do they come from? Well, in part by design, right? In 1889, the Benedictine monks started this college. They had something in mind, right? Even though the idea of a college wasn't new, they were gonna try to do something that they already knew existed elsewhere, uh, partly by design, but always unintentionally to some extent. Nobody can plan this thing out. There's enough spontaneity in life that uh, social structures aren't the way anybody wants. Uh, and if you want to prove it to yourself, start a committee to do something and then discover that the darn committee starts doing things you don't want it to do in the first place, right? Uh, it's just the way life works. So if we think about our moral life, daily moral agency, our making decisions all day long, we enter into pre-existing social positions and make decisions based on whatever our goals are in the field of restrictions and opportunities. This happens when we go to the gas station to fill our tank of gas. It happens when you get on the bus. It happens when you watch TV, when, walking across a crosswalk. There are restrictions and opportunities built into the structure. And so when I'm going to walk across a crosswalk, I'll watch whether the light is red or green because there will be some restrictions if I don't, right? I might end up dead. And we experience these restrictions and opportunities as incentives or disincentives. All right, so we often say at work or wherever we are, well, he's got the incentive to do that or a disincentive to do that. Uh, and that has to do with what those restrictions are doing. Now, structures don't change very often or very much. So consider the first example you thought about. Something at work that you didn't want to do but now are so used to doing that it doesn't bother you. Sociologists would say, your willingness to go along with that reproduces that social structure, right? You didn't do it in order to reproduce it, right? Nobody starts a new business in order to keep capitalism going. Nobody gets married in order to keep the, the family structure going in the world. Uh, we, no, we do it for the values and decisions we're making, but in the process we have these social effects. And so every time we say, oh, well, I'll do that. I don't, I'd rather not, but I'll do it. Uh, we tend to reproduce the social structure, whatever it is. But of course, social structures can change. And when a group refuses to go along, of course, it's going to pay the price for violating a restriction, but it might bring in a change in the social structure. 
So that can be a big kind of change. Think of uh, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, right? We just had this lecture this afternoon on racism. Some of you may have been there. I was happy to be there. Um, what happened there? African Americans were willing to pay the price to violate restrictions, to sit in the front of the bus, to sit at lunch counters, to march through cities, and they paid the price. But it was enough, and a lot of other things have to happen too, to change the structure of many American institutions. Uh, but the same is true if you're a secretary in the office and you think the boss's rules for the photocopier are, are stupid. Um, you may stand up and let your voice be known, and you may have to pay a price. If your boss is enlightened, he or she will listen to you, but some bosses aren't, and they may take it personally, and you might, some people therefore keep quiet, but you might bring about a change. So there's a whole range of different ways in which we can encounter resistance. Huh? Um, and so it does ask us, though, along this line of justice in the workplace, is there anything at work that would be so wrong from your point of view that you would refuse to do it? It's a sobering question. And of course, depending on your workplace, maybe there's already something there that's so wrong that you've avoided doing and hope you, nobody's really going to push you to do it. Um, the, of course, the, the, one of the elements of a good job is that the restrictions that you face are ones you're quite happy with. It doesn't bother you, right? They're, they're not challenging your morals, not challenging even your personality. That's a great job. Huh? But a lot of people, of course, don't have jobs like that and face some terrible choices. I have a friend who is an economist in Buenos Aires. And uh, he gives workshops for local government. And he knows a mayor of a small city in Argentina who was offered a $50,000 bribe from a drug cartel. And the bribe was accompanied with the threat that if he did not accept the bribe, they would kidnap his son. That is a tough job to have. So, is there anything at work that you'd disagree with enough that you'd try to change it? And we all face those questions, right? Things that may not be big moral questions, or might be, but might just be ordinary, this should go better. And do I go to the boss and try to persuade a, a change? Do I, as a faculty member, do I go to the dean? The last time I went to the dean, I lost. Uh, <laughs> what, you know, what can you do? Um, or, or do you say, well, you know, I'm probably going to lose. I'm not going to bother. Uh, we all face those decisions all the time. And what I think we want to know here in terms of this question of justice and virtue is that it isn't just how the photocopier is working, but also moral questions that can be analyzed by this same system. Because it's often not the boss who is personally making this thing happen that you find objectionable from a moral point of view. but. The boss is simply going to say, well, I don't have any choice. You know, I have bosses too. I can't, and you hear that from administrators, and to some degree it's true. Um, it's not my rule. I can't change that. And so what do you do, and how do you, how do you go from there? So there clearly is a role for virtue, because when facing a restriction that pushes you to do something wrong from your own moral conviction, this is wrong, um, the price you have to pay to violate the restriction is a factor, right? How serious a price must you pay um, for not doing something you think is wrong? If you're, the price is minor, most of us would be willing. But if you're going to lose your job and you're not sure if you got another one, well, a much harder thing to decide. And then it's going to depend on well, how serious is it wrong and all lots of moral questions there, huh? So. Uh, your own conviction, your commitment, your virtue, as we would put it in ethics, uh, not to do such things uh, that may be unjust to you, unjust to others. Um, these are usually things that aren't the personal decision of our boss, but are structured into the workplace, or the classroom, or the parish, or where other, any other thing we're going to talk about. So I want to add one conceptual element to all of this and talk a little bit about power. 
just for an easy definition, we'll say that power over another person is the capacity to alter what that person will do, what they decide to do. So it's not all about power. I, I'm going to talk about power. There, whenever there's power involved, it isn't all that's there. As a professor, I have power over my students. I give them grades, right? And they worry, some of them, will their grade be so low that that's going to affect their GPA and they won't get the job they want or into the grad school they want. Now, power is not the main thing between me and my students. And I think, especially for me, of course, I don't, people who have power tend not to notice it. But even for them, I hope that isn't the main thing. And I think it isn't in their lives, uh, in their relationship with me. Um, but I know it's there. Students do worry about their grades. Um, and so it's not the most important, but in a good organization, power is kind of in the background. You don't even worry that you're going to fail this course. That's the ultimate penalty a professor is going to give you in this course. Um, when I'm driving down the road, I'm not worried that I'm going to get thrown into jail. Uh, though I don't drive more than five miles over the speed limit, just in case I might get a ticket, there's a restriction in the structure. And the policeman would enforce it, but he didn't invent the rule. Um, so uh, power is part of relationships, even though in well-functioning organizations, it's in the background. So there are three kinds of power in social structures. Two of them we've already mentioned without naming power. Restrictions have a kind of constrictive power. It constricts my options. Because if I do that, I'm going to pay a price. If I do that, I'm going to pay a price. So I can still violate that, but the power appears to me as a constriction of my options. But power can also be the opportunity, enticing me to do something, right? The sales manager that tells the sales force, if you can exceed your goals from last year by 10%, you get this bonus. Well, that's an enticement, right? That is, it's, it's power because it's a way of changing how people decide to live their lives. The, the salespeople may now work harder this year to sell more things, whether, whatever our firm is selling. And I suppose we might say that grades can be either a restriction or an enticement, right? The, the F and D are restrictions. The A and the B uh, may be enticements, right? And students that, with different interests and capacities and interests in your discipline uh, in the same class have different reactions, but that's how the power I wield affects students. So we have constrictive and enticing power, and then we also have something I would call constitutive power, because over the long run, if you do something enough for enough days and weeks and months, you start changing who you are. You start to become the kind of person who makes the decisions that you've been making for the last months and years. Now, ideally, that's a person you want to become, but under restrictions, you might not. So think of the professor's power. We talked about the low grade. Uh, there's the possibility of an unacceptable uh, disapproval of unacceptable behavior that uh, students might worry about. And the opportunities entice of power for an A or maybe a letter of recommendation from a professor you get to know. Um, and of course, constitutive power, which all of us faculty hope we wield, um, that in the long run, we're forming better intellectual habits in our students. So when I use that green pen and tell my students a better grammar on this sentence, I'm hoping they learn to be better writers. When I insist in class conversation that somebody who made an outrageous statement the guy in the back of the room just for, I, I, okay, tell me more about that. I want to hear your reasoning about that. We're trying to instill intellectual habits, and we hope that over the four years of college, people learn that. So it turns out that the power of powerful persons is largely due to the power generated by the social structure in which that person holds a position. So we tend to personalize power and think of my boss as the guy who's doing all this. But in fact, it's the structure, because he too has restrictions and opportunities to which he's responding, or she. So the power of the powerful, we can say the position that they hold requires various decisions. And decisions are affected by restrictions and opportunities. And the leader's virtue or vice may 
lead him or her to violate some of the restrictions that they face or not to take up an opportunity they face because they're a virtuous person or on the negative side because maybe they're not a virtuous person they end up doing things that would be morally objectionable so the virtue is really important even in our daily life in how we respond to these structured restrictions and opportunities we may decide not to take up that opportunity because it's not going to be good for us or we're going to violate this restriction. So it's a really important question for Christian ethics, how virtue and social structures interact. And you have here uh, at St. A's, uh, Dan Daly sitting here in the front row, perhaps the country's expert on this question of the relation of virtue and social structure. Uh, it's a really important question. And because ethicists have not dealt with structures very, for very long, um, it's not very well developed in Christian ethics. So where do we go with this? Well, I want to go back and suggest that there's something that each of us who are leaders could do in our business. If you're the parish priest, you could do it with the parish council or the representatives of the parish. If you're in a, a student club, you can ask these same questions. If you want to look at what might produce more justice. So you call a meeting, and you identify the relevant subgroups. Now, it may be that every it's a small enough meeting, everybody gets to speak, and you haven't got to identify subgroups. It might be if it's going to be the student body doing this, you have to figure out who the representatives are going to be and what are the various groups. Um, in a faculty department, an academic department, the subgroups are certainly going to include men and women, senior faculty and junior faculty. They're going to include uh, racial differences, gender differences, uh, various kinds of things. Huh? So what do you do? You ask each subgroup, what are the restrictions and opportunities facing people in your subgroup? So if I'm the leader, I may not even be aware of the restrictions that you're feeling. I'm a senior member of my department. I'm in two departments, but anyway, I, I don't, do I really know how the young professors are feeling these days? What they see as restrictions? Um, what they see as opportunities? Because it's a fact that opportunities, which are largely privileges, and restrictions, restrictions uh, constricting us, they might be justifiable. They might be warranted. Or not, right? <coughs> And so this raises the question about justice in our group, our workplace, our parish, wherever this discussion happens. And it's a difficult thing for a leader to do, I think, to have this conversation, because of course those of us that have been around for a longer time do have opportunities, privileges, that others don't have. Uh, we have fewer restrictions usually than others have. And it might be perfectly warranted. It might be perfectly justifiable. But you might have to justify it if somebody says, well, how come you get to do that and I don't? Right? How come I got to do this and you don't? In an academic department, it's often who teaches, who has to teach the introductory courses and who gets to teach more of the courses in their own sub-discipline that they really love to teach, right? And frankly, it's usually us older faculty that get to teach the things that we really want. We teach fewer of the things that everybody is an, has an obligation to teach that are somewhat less interesting. Introductory courses can be quite interesting, but your own field is somehow a little bit more engaging, subfield, I should say. So this would mean in a workforce that you, one could have these kind of conversations, but it means that the manager and the, of the work group will have to say why it is that certain people have privileges that others don't. So what I haven't done here is tell you anything about how to resolve these questions. And I don't have time to do it, and I don't know your workplace. I, I wouldn't know the answer. So in the moral question is still there. How do you adjudicate this? What critical realism does, I mean, these are social scientists, right? They, don't, they can't answer our moral questions. They can't answer our, our theological questions. But they can help concretize the question. They can help phrase the question, get the question on the table so that we have to face it. So it's a serious mistake to think that all we need for a just world 
is properly structured organizations. I don't mean to claim that's all we need. But it's equally wrong to believe that all we need are cultural change and virtuous people, because that alone will not change the structures. Our moral agency in structures goes this way. In any organizations, structural restrictions penalize some sorts of activities, and opportunities reward other kinds of activities. The moral challenge is to line up the restrictions and opportunities with our values. And the best way to find out about that is to ask everybody. Thank you very much.